Um, I actually had exactly the same feeling when, when Peter gave me a call about a half year ago um, to talk about London's air ambulance and my experience with London air ambulance on the mountain and high altitude medicine symposium. Um, as you can imagine, there are no mountains. It's never really cold. It's never really hot. Um, so really hard to compare the, the two systems. Um, but there are things which, which you can talk about and still, I think, make it quite interesting. Um, and it was a really, really good experience for myself and a um, lot to learn from, from London and also from the UK. The UK has, they are quite similar in all of their ambulance systems. Um, obviously, I would like to start with the obvious differences, um, which is quite, um, if you're flying with a helicopter on a very dense, popular, uh, popular city like London, with all these world famous um, sites around, um, it's really exciting and like amazing flying on top of London and landing on these, all these um, sites. But to be fair, after flying in, in Graz as well and, and flying around in the mountains, I have to admit it's at, at least as, as amazing to fly in the mountains than in a city like London. So um, the big differences, there are differences, but um, obviously each system has its special specialities. Um, one main thing in London, obviously, is finding a landing spot. But you wouldn't imagine how many green spots there are. I mean, there are the, the parks, and I put all the, um, the main landing sites. We called them Gucci landings when you were able to land in the middle of the city, like Trafalgar Square or the Parliament, Houses, houses of Parliament, next to the Houses of Parliament. Um, but they were actually quite rare. So normally, you, you end up doing this once in your rotation, maybe less. Um, most of the jobs are actually in the rural sub area, uh, in the suburban areas of London, not in the city itself. And there you normally end up in a park, um, most of the times actually quite far away from the scene. Uh, sometimes you have to take the police to get to scene from, from, from the landing site um, because of obviously the regulations got much, much tighter since the early beginnings of learning uh, London's air ambulance in the beginning of the 1990s where they actually landed, for example, on, on Piccadilly Circus or in the middle of Oxford Street, um, which is not allowed anymore. Um, on the other hand, Austrian HEM service, and I guess every other Alpine HEM systems, definitely has its uh, challenges with landing sites as well, as you can see on this one uh, um, mountain road, where you have to get the helicopter as close as possible to the patient and um, get the team out and also the same issue, trying to get the, the team as close as possible to the patient, not making them um, walk or hike for another hour. And obviously what, what, what we do, what London doesn't do, is the, is the long lining or winching in other HEM services, not the, the Christophers uh, Flugrettungsverein, um, because we only do the long line. Um, and this sets a whole difference in, in what you can take with you, because London's air ambulance is the 15-minute the flight circle is actually quite um, quite small, as the same, same distance as, as our helicopters, but average flight time in London is about six minutes or even less than this. Um, and there, is a lot of, um, there are a lot of small airports where the, the air ambulance can get their fuel. So even if in between jobs they would fly to the next base and get refueling done and all these kind of things. So London's air ambulance definitely can take much, much more equipment um, compared to, to the service, for example, we fly with. Um, I have an image here showing the difference. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see Richard Webb Stevens. He's one of the paramedics who worked with me during the rotation. Um, we called him our mule because he really tried to carry all the equipment by himself. Um, but that, this is, for a major job, this is what we had to carry with us. Um, the, the red bag um, in his hand is, is the trauma bag, what we call it. It has all the equipment for splinting, tourniquets, um, special gauzes for, uh, um, to, to stop bleedings, but also the, the equipment for RSI, pediatric and adult um, RSI equipment was in, in the red bag. Um, there's a similar size bag which you can't see on his back, which is the monitor bag. It has all the equipment for monitoring a patient um, and obviously the suction unit. So these three devices we always carry to the, to the patient. Um, the big other bags which are on, on his neck and around his neck are the ones we would, we would carry if we, I mean, if we are close to the, to the scene, the, the pilots probably would bring it to, uh, to scene as well. They were quite helpful. Um, but if we had to run or had to take the police um, to the scene, we had to carry them right, right away with us. 
Um, the red bag carried all the equipment for the thoracotomies um, and the, the blood. We had four units of blood with us um, and central lines as well. And the, the, green, the green bag was the equipment for the, for the Reboa, which also was performed by the team um, out in the fields. And then on the right side is a friend of mine, Giza Gemesh. Um, this is from Christophorus 12, pretty much what we normally, to a standard case, what we carry. So it's a small backpack and a monitor. Um, you try to keep it as, as small as possible, um, just uh, in case you end up on the mountain and you don't want to carry like, the same amount of um, equipment like London does. Um, the next few fl slides, um, I would like to talk about the charity itself to get some understanding about the big difference. I hope I, I assume that most of people of the people in the audience um, know the the Alpine system quite well and London's air ambulance is the um, the new stuff. So um, London's air ambulance is actually a charity. That's completely different to the system in in, in Austria. So the the, the funding um, for the for the the system, which is about they they need about ten million pounds a year um, to keep the system running, and most of the money actually comes from from funding and donations from the people in London, from rallies and um, lotteries, um, events they do. They, they do some upsailing from, from the helipad at the Royal London Hospital and um, these fundings, but they also have um, big companies which spend a lot of money. Um, you might have seen the picture of the, the red helicopter with the Virgin sign on it, so this was one of the main sponsors at one point. Um, this is where they get the money from. Um, it's not completely charity. Um, it does have some support from the NHS um, and this is mainly the paramedics and the doctors. So the paramedics, all the paramedics at London's Air Ambulance come from um, the London Ambulance Service Trust um, and they pay for the rotation um, with London's Air Ambulance. And the same is true for the doctors. Um, all of the doctors are paid by Bart's Health NHS Trust. But there are quite a few more people around, like the the charity staff, which does all the, um, the fundraising, the helipad crew, which is, the f which is part of the firemen, the operational team, which is up at the helipad, um, and also the pilots. They are paid by the donations themselves. Um, I pull up these pictures because the system is 24-7, so they, um, it was not from the beginning. So in, in they actually started, the early vision of London's Airmen, I, I have to swap back, um, was in 1986. Actually, quite a bit later than than the European countries started with hem services, um, but it was Alistair Wilson with a few friends from the Royal London Hospital who actually s decided that they would need something similar in London um, because of the the traffic accidents they see and that the patients were treated much too late for the for the serious injuries, and so they wanted to to perform something or get something established quite similar to this. Um, the charity finally was established in 1989 and I think the first jobs with the helicopter uh, on trauma scenes was in the 1990s, beginning of 1990s. Um, so it took quite a while and it's still um, a long time after the European helicopter services. And initially the, the helicopter obviously was only flying during the day and there was no night team any available. Um, they changed this. Um, nowadays um, the helicopter still flies during the daylight hours and if the weather is good enough to fly, so if there's fog which happens quite often, actually, especially in winter time, um, or bad weather. Um, you can't. We, we couldn't use the helicopter, um, and during the night time, um, we use these um, red Skoda cars, which are which were called RRVs, rapid response vehicles. Um, pretty much a similar um, system like we have our NAFs or NFs. Um, obviously, they are. It's much harder to reach the the scenes with the car compared to the helicopter, but there is no option. And I think they still, I talked to the pilots um, a few times about potential night flying in London, but they said they couldn't do it because of the, it's just too bright in London. They can't use NVGs. They, they wouldn't see anything. It's just too bright to fly with NVGs. But then where you would need it for the exact landing, you can't do it with, without an NVG. And, and that's why they probably will stick to the system. Um, just to, to give you an impression on, of what and where London's Air Ambulance operates. So this is a map, it's the southeastern region of the United Kingdom, um, and this uh, blue circle uh, indicates the uh, M25, that's the circular motorway around the urban area of London, metropolitan area of London. This is pretty much if the 
I hope this works now. Um, can you see the arrow? Oh, no. So the, the orange square sto uh, spot, that's the Royal London Hospital. Um, and this is where the, the helicopter is um, stationed during the day. And from this point, they can reach pretty much every, um, every area, of, uh, every scene within this blue circle within 15 minutes. This is equivalent um, to our, our 15 minutes flight radius. I just tried to use a, a proportional uh, impression to see this. So if, if you look at um, the Christopher 6 here in Salzburg, this is probably what the helicopter would need to fly 15 minutes. Um, um, it's quite... For, for some people, it's quite strange that London actually has only one system uh, with a pre-hospital emergency physician on board. So um, you would imagine, why is there only one doctor-staffed emergency system in London? Um, they have about 10 to 12 million. Nobody really knows how many people are in London during the day with all the commuters and um, tourists. And so they really literally have only one doctor-staffed system for this. Area-wise, it's an issue. If you look at our system, this is only um, has only the, the, the stations from the Christophorus Flugverteidigungsverein. There are obviously much more providers in, in Austria as well, especially in the western region of Austria. But just from the region-wise, you don't need as much helicopter. Um, one helicopter is definitely enough for this area. But what's with the rest? And I will go into the topic of paramedic, the, the, the whole UK system, which is not it's not comparable to our system here in, in, um, in Austria. But I just want to point out a few more things which I think are quite important for, um, to understand um, the system in London. So first of all, all these dots on the screen are the hospital which can treat trauma patients. The circular ones are trauma units. They're not made for major trauma centers. And the square ones are the four major trauma centers in London. So this is the Royal London Hospital, the orange one. The greenish one is the King's, is King's College, bluish is um, St. George's and red um, St. Mary's Hospital. And three of them have a helipad. Um, this is quite new because I think till five years ago only the Royal London Hos uh, Hospital had a, a helipad. The only um, major drama center with a helipad on top. Um, and you would imagine that you fly quite a lot because that's normally the general synapses that you think it's not only to bring the, the team to the patients, but carry the patients quickly back to the hospital. But um, I think about, I would say, 90% of the cases we, we, we carried the patients uh, with the road ambulance. So in London, the, the helicopter is literally to get the team to scene. And in most of the cases, you can reach one of those four MTCs within 25 minutes. And this time was the cutoff for us, where we had to make the decision to take the helicopter or to take the, the patient by road. Um, it was paramount to, to, to cha uh, choose the, the, the vehicle which is the quickest for the patient to the definitive care. So when you just think about loading, even if the helicopter is next to you, loading the patient on the, on the, on the helicopter takes about 15, 15 minutes. Um, then if you have a flying time, about 5 minutes, that's 20 minutes. And then it takes still, from the Royal London Hospital to A&E in the recess room, it takes still 10 minutes. Um, so if you add up all these times, you, would, uh, you can imagine how far you can get by, by car. Plus, you can do much more interventions during your travel. So this, is, this um, play and go on routes um, is, is quite important in London as well. Uh, now, just a word to the paramedic system um, in the UK, because that's obviously... Um, I, heard, I saw the discussion yesterday in Graz uh, at the conference about the, the potential changes or wishes how we could change our system in Austria. But um, the paramedic system is, is actually quite old, like in all the um, Anglo-American systems. But they, I think in 2010, they changed the whole um, education system. It's still not completely established, but this is what they, they aim for. So nowadays, um, a paramedic has a three years um, university college um, bachelor's degree to become a paramedic. After three years, he's allowed to work on his own as a standard road paramedic um, in, in an ambulance service. And these are the, the advanced steps. You can see there are different areas where you can, can focus your education on. It's either on the clinical practice or education research, wherever you want. But you have to work to go on with your um, training. You have to work as a paramedic for an, at least three years on the road before you can apply for a specialist um, paramedic post. Um, the whole post itself is again a three years training, so that's another three years to become a master paramedic. 
Um, and at this point, you advanced paramedics. And I've, at London, and the areas around London are now are this in the state that they have a few advanced paramedics. This is nine years of training in pre-hospital, focused training in pre-hospital emergency medicine, um, which we, if we talk about pre-hospital notfall sanitators and all this kind of with, with, with training, that's what, what, what we probably should aim for and not only um, two, uh, two years or what, whatever we are talking at the moment. So I think if, if you want to go um, paramedic system, this is probably what you, what you need. And the experience for me in the UK, and if, if, I, if I'm getting right, this is, it's not talking about either or, it's more a system of, of working together. So you want the paramedic system, but you want also the doctor for the, for the level three um, treatment of patients. Um, so, and all the other emergencies, I didn't say that uh, in my talks before. So trauma, London's Air Ambulance is, pretty, is just literally for trauma only. So all the other emergencies like stroke, MIs, um, cardiac arrests, unconscious people, um, not so serious trauma are all done by the paramedics themselves. There are six advanced paramedics in London at the moment, um, or four, four uh, 24 hour services they would go to every cardiac arrest in addition to the other road paramedics. So they specialize in, the, uh, in, in cardiac arrest treatment, um, advanced uh, ALS with, with ultrasound um, intubation, which is not done by the London paramedics, the standard London paramedic anymore. Yep, um, this is the mission map from 2017. So you could see what, what London Air Ambulance, the small round circles are the, the boroughs where they fly to and you can Imagine by just by the counts where the dangerous areas are. So East London, um, North London, and South London are probably the, the most dangerous areas you could go to. Um, and in the bottom left corner, you can see the, the, uh, the, the trauma chops they went to. So it's, it's quite a lot of, of penetrating trauma in London. So this is definitely not comparable to Austria. Um, and 2017 was the first year for London's air ambulance where, where stabbings and shootings, the penetrating trauma, actually were higher than the road traffic collisions. And also if I compare my, the, the road traffic collisions to the, to the jobs I do here in Austria on the Christophorus um, Zitzwölf, um, in London you pretty much don't have high-speed car accidents. There's always standstill. There's, it's just a traffic jam everywhere. Um, so most most of the road traffic um, accidents you go to in London is pretty much pedestrian versus bus, pedestrian versus car, um, a cyclist run over by a HGV, a lorry, a big car. So these are the typical cases you go to um, as a as London ambulance service, uh, London air ambulance service. And then there are the typical other working um, page, uh, working. Um, accidents like falling from heights, from from scaffoldings, and all these kind of things. Um, they do have also quite a lot of people suicide attempts with the tube. So this is another big, big um, part of the of the cake, and also the drownings in the Thames um, are quite common, where we have to go to, or where we had to go to. Um, so there are obviously a few medical um, innovations which uh, London's air ambulance is world famous. Um, the one one procedure is the thoracotomy. Um, this is mainly done for penetrating trauma stab wounds. Like I said, um, last year I think they attended more than 700 stabbings on the central area. They, they only go to, to stabbings in the, in the danger area, which is neck, the trunk, and the, the inguinal area. So every extremity with a stabbing they don't go to. This is done by the paramedics them, themselves. And if you, if you just think about 700 stabbings in the central core area, um, this is where you go to. Most of these stabbings, you don't do anything. You just go there. They have their, they have their IV axis, and you just get them in the back of an ambulance and go. Um, on the other hand, the paperwork for these jobs is amazing. It's about an hour's work, writing up everything, um, because you have to have detailed reports for police and the coroners and whatever. But a few patients actually have a cardiac arrest just in front of you, and this is where you would perform the, the emergency clamshell thoracotomy um, to decompress the to de decompress a pericardial effusion or pericardial clot, and they were quite successful. Proved that actually the right patient um, at the right time you can get quite good outcomes with this procedure. And quite new, even for London's air ambulance, is the the, the procedure of Reboa, which is the um, 
um, retrograde endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, where they put um, a catheter with a balloon in the in the lower aorta only for the for the lower um, uh, body. So pelvic injuries is the main indication for this. Pelvic HCV run over in cyclists. This is the typical or falls from height. This is where you would put in the reboa pre-hospitally. Um, in the end, most of these procedures are still done not quite often. I mean, the, the, the thoracotomies you do, they're, they're about 50 to 70 a year. And during your six month, a six-month rotation, the chance of doing one is quite high, but you end up normally doing one or two in, in your rotation. But there's one more. And how, how can you get the people? And this is one of the things which was most impressive for me. And this is not only true for the for London Air Ambulance. This is also true for the rest of the... Um, um, other air ambulances which I worked for um, is the, the catchy phrase or the, the phrase clinical governance, which was uncommon for me from Austria going to the, to the UK. Um, this is part of every medical um, um, system, every hospital and every um, ambulance service has to do some clinical governance. And this is um, a tight evaluation. So it's the training, um, it's the evaluation of what you're doing. Um, a clini clinical all it means so, for example, we had two D and D sessions. This um, this is M and M mobility and mortality uh, mo uh, mobility and mortality ma mobility and mortality sessions. We had two a week, um, where pretty much randomly cases from the last couple of days were taken out of the drawer, and you had to discuss them. Um, and everything, every detail of, of each case was gone through. So you sit there with the consultants um, and go through the case. And this is means um, evaluation of of dispatching. First, so they start with the dispatching. Was the dispatching correct? Th could they have sent another system? Could they have not sent? Could they have sent to a different system? Um, they would go through your notes. If you have no, uh, written down everything, you should run, write down. And this is because they set their standards. They have their SOPs. Um, and I think in Austria, it's always like, like the dogs. When you hear SOPs, the, the dog get the hairs on the back and uh, don't SOPs. We don't want SOPs. But I, to be fair, it's just you set your standards and this is the measurement you want to, to achieve and this is your, your basic to, to evaluate if, if everything is going right or not. Um, and this was really impressive. So the, the clinical effectiveness is coming out of this. So you, eva you evaluate actually if the procedures, or are they actually helpful for the patient um, or are we doing more harm? Research and development um, is quite uncomparable for systems how much they publish in London. They, they get so much data and everything is written down in, in, the, in the computer and there's so much research from, from London's air ambulance in this short period of time. Um, Christophorus Flugrettungsverein could probably do in three or four years, we could do the same amount of trauma patients um, with all the 16 helicopters. But um, as far as I know, we, we don't even reach the, the level of research what, what they do in London. Um, and obviously risk management and, and openness, which is talking about errors, um, was, was really impressive. Um, a few more slides about the training, because that's, that was also something new for me. So on the helipad, that's the 17th floor of the Royal London Hospital. Um, they are actually quite famous for the low fidelity training. So they don't do high simulation, high fidelity simulation. They have, you can see when they're not used to the mannequins, they're just on a pile underneath the, the, the the walkway where you take down the patients, um, but you were pretty much expected every day when you were on the shi on shift, or even if you're not on shift, when you're when you're on the rotation, um, you are there 24/7 pretty much. <laughs> so you either do your paperwork or you train or whatever whatever has to be done. Checking equipment is always um, what you have to do. But these mannequins they can be used quite um, uh, sufficiently if you if you make this, the, the scenarios around it, and they are, they, they are getting really good at it. Um, so they just have clothing, wigs, everything from police. They get the medical students to help with the sceneries. Um, they would splash you with waters if they want to simulate um, uh, rain showers and all these kinds of, they have a hose and you just have to RSI the, the mannequins with the, the hose running down on, on your back just to get you off, the, um, off your concentration. Or, for example, they have their, their special uh, secret mixture of vomit, which uh, they wouldn't give to me. But it's, it's amazing. If you are on the scene, it looks and smells awful. <laughs> and they pour it over your hands. And you can imagine how you like, get really disrupted by this. Yeah, it's, they, they really make them very lively, these, um, these scenarios. And, and they, they do it literally every, every minute they have free time. 
um, and you have not to ch check equipment, um, you're doing scenarios. Um, and obviously they have their courses. The same is also true, I think I have only five minutes left, the same is also true um, for these main procedures, Reboa and, and thoracotomy, because um, since I'm back in Austria, there's always the discussion, so you have done the thoracotomy? This is probably not for our system. We will never, emergency physician in Austria will end up doing a thoracotomy because it's such a rare case in Austria. Um, and obviously London can do it. They do 50 to 70 a year, it's quite simple, they, they have a lot of training. But you have to imagine that actually, um, nowadays, the rotation of being with the London Arms is only six months. And um, the way you learn it is reading, this, reading the, the, the paperwork, talking through with the consultants um, through a scenario, and then doing the moulaging of, of, of these um, indications. And that's where you learn it. And most of the doctors actually perform the first thoracotomy on their own without supervision. Um, and it works really well. And this is also true if you know this, this is the, the, the probably the most famous publication if you, if you talk about the um, thoracotomy, for example. Um, it's, it didn't state in the, in, the, in the paper itself, but when you talk to Gareth Davis, these are the 13 survivors. They have had 74 patients with a, uh, with a cardiac which actually met um, the, the inclusion criteria to perform a thoracotomy, which is the cardiac standstill arises next to you at within five minutes before you arrived. Um, and these 13 are the ones which have survived. And the interesting part about it is none of those thoracotomies was performed by a, th by a surgeon. All of them were done by anesthesiologists or uh, emergency physicians. And each and all of them was done the first one they have done. So it's not like experienced users. It's the first one you perform. Um, and I wonder, it's not really hard to think and go through the procedure. Um, we also learn how to perform a front of neck access if you want to have an um, airway, although this is probably more likely to, to hit, um, hit in Austria. Or we, we, we learn how to, to do a breech birth, which probably no one as a pre-hospital emergency physician really um, attends. But um, just to point out um, that the goal from London's Air Ambulance, and I want to sum it up by this, this um, the main points, of the talk, why, why you could compare these two services. Obviously, they are the aviation systems, but this, this, this drive for clinical excellence is, is something you, you could get really into. So you, you, every patient ha deserves at least a chance. And this is, this is what they aim for. Um, you better perform something if you do it in an honorable idea. It's not, not if you want to do thoracotomies and cut up every, every patient, that's not what they want. But if you do it because you think you can save it, this is uh, save the person, then that's what they want. They want, they want to give every patient um, a chance to survive. And for me, um, the experience of the clinical governance, which is not only in London, but also with the East Anglian Air Ambulance, um, was something that I haven't seen in Austria before. Thank you very much.